Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's Container Journal webinar. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, I'm the moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great webinar on tap, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for our speaker, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question. And we'll get, try to get to as many questions as we can near the end of today's webinar. Also at the end of today's webinar, we're going to be doing a drawing for two $50 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our two lucky winners. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is Simplify Your Way to Expert Kubernetes Management. Our speaker today is Sean Roth, who is Director of Product Marketing at Cloud Native Solutions at Nutanix. Hi, Sean, thanks so much for joining me today. Well, thank you both for having me. It's, uh, it's really great to be here. Great, well, I'm gonna put myself um, on mute and uh, let you get right to your presentation. All right, thanks so much. All right, well, uh, greetings to everyone who joined. Um, you know, really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedules today to, uh, to be on this program. Um, we're gonna cover quite a bit of ground. Um, the, the main focus of the presentation is really around finding ways to simplify critical areas of managing Kubernetes. And this in itself has, has ramped up to become an incredibly uh, deep and often complex technology and, and topic. Um, so in the presentation, we'll, we'll kind of give some uh, context around cloud native technologies. We'll have a look at, at Kubernetes itself. And probably helps if I go to the agenda slide here. Um, and then the, the main substance is really gonna be around these, these seven areas. Now, the, the seven areas that, that we've picked out here is by no means an exhaustive list. Uh, these are just seven areas where you know, we, we see um, a lot of uh, time and focus uh, put on them you know, from our customers and, and folks uh, in the industry. So um, hopefully you, you find uh, some valuable guidance and um, and substance here, and then we'll wrap things up with a, a Q and A. So just to level set a little bit, um, I designed this webinar program mainly for IT operations professionals, and you know folks that are part of organizations that are just starting to get into uh, adopting containers and Kubernetes. That's probably um, you know how the material is is tuned. Um, they're obviously you know, many more advanced topics to cover in each of these areas that we'll talk about uh, can run really deep, but hopefully this provides like a good basis for moving forward with your, uh, with, with your adoption of cloud native technology. All right, so let's dive right in. I, I like to set a little context and, um, you know, cloud native is a term that gets used uh, so often and, and in so many different ways in, in the industry. And you know what? What ultimately does that mean? Um, you kind of hear it used in in many different ways, but um, cloud native. Um, I, I found a really good set of uh, of attributes here, and and these are a, a list of ten from uh, from the new stack. And you know, cloud native. You know, you you as I mentioned, you hear this quite a bit in discussions about containers and and Kubernetes, but um, wanted to just go through this, and I think it's 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 a good way to kind of set the context for um, for what we're going to talk about. So first and foremost, um, you know, a cloud native application is something that is built in containers. So sort of the uh, the the atomic component of, of software here, when you can write code and package it up with all of its dependencies. Um, Cloud native applications are developed with best of breed languages and frameworks. Uh, you know, the, the beauty of, of this is that you can employ uh, a lot of different tools and, and techniques in, in building code. 
um, being able to build software uh, instead of one big monolith, you can build something that's that's made up of uh, broken out into services and you know, kind of made in a way um, where you're dealing with smaller, more composable pieces. And then four, I, I like this one a lot because um, you know it, it, you bring in um, APIs and um, you have, um, I, I think within the cloud native community, you've got a tremendous amount of collaboration um, and interaction amongst folks that are focused on, on all kinds of different areas <clears throat> related to Kubernetes. And so, you know, having a, a technology where <clears throat> you've opened it up, um, you know, for others to be able to use and integrate into their systems, um, that is a, a very common thread here. So number five, um, applications that are architected or, or at least um, environments that are architected with uh, you know, clean separation of stateless and stateful services. Um, there, there definitely is a, a need to do that given uh, you know, how stateful applications have really grown um, in, in terms of popularity and, and what's involved in, um, in maintaining those supporting those versus just a, a stateless application from an infrastructure standpoint that is isolated from server and operating system dependencies well that's that's really you know the the main crux of containerization is that um, with virtualization you were able to abstract the the system from the underlying hardware and now with containers you can abstract the software from the underlying OS so deployed on, on self-service elastic cloud infrastructure. Uh, yes, this is where things get really interesting from an IT ops standpoint. Um, you know, managed through agile DevOps processes. I think we all have seen that um, containers and Kubernetes have, have really changed the way that software is being developed and has like kind of like rocketed forward DevOps uh, methodologies. Uh, automated capabilities, automation is, is so key. And in the context of managing Kubernetes, um, that, that is going to be your friend. Uh, that's going to be a common theme when we get to the, the section in, in this program about um, how, how to focus your attention on making Kubernetes simpler. And then uh, having an application that can really is driven, you know, the, the management of it is driven by uh, policy and, and resource allocation. So I just 10 attributes, I, I think this really encapsulates, at least, you know, from what I've seen out there, this is the best definition of what, what it means to be uh, cloud native. So with all of that, um, you know, come some big challenges. And again, sort of from the, the shoes of, of an IT operations professional, somebody tasked with, um, you know, moving a, a digital transformation project forward and adopting Kubernetes, um, you quickly get a sense that Kubernetes is is incredibly deep in terms of functionality and it's complex. And it just it we we've seen an evolution of it that just you know keeps accelerating. So, for instance, in the past year, uh, I think there were four major releases of Kubernetes, uh, each introducing substantial new functionality. So. Uh, you know, w with that, um, you know, you, you've got this incredible ecosystem of, of technologies around it. You know, how do you possibly keep up with, um, with how the space is developing? And then, um, especially in the case when you're looking to uh, leverage your existing data center uh, for deploying Kubernetes and, and cloud native applications, a lot of times you, you run into issues because legacy infrastructure just isn't really architected for the way that containerized applications will use resources. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that throughout uh, the remainder of the presentation here, we'll talk about some more specific examples. So a lot of times, um, you, you know, you, you see quite a few um, enterprise organizations start off in, in the public cloud and, you know, if they're significantly down the road in terms of their their adoption of Kubernetes. Um, they're, they're doing a lot in the public cloud and um, it it absolutely makes sense. Public cloud is incredibly easy to use and you know you obviously don't have to worry about so many things that you normally would 
if you were to look at building your own Kubernetes environment on-prem. So it begs the question, why, why would you do that? And I think there, there, are, there are some compelling reasons and um, we're, we're definitely seeing uh, a, a, a decent uptick in um, probably the, the number of organizations that are uh, building you know, production grade uh, Kubernetes infrastructure. You know, the first is cost efficiency. I think it, you know it's fair to say that um, you know public cloud, while it's 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 a great immediate and you know often inexpensive op uh, option to get your um, you know to get your applications up and running, it may not be the cheapest option for some workloads, especially at scale. So that's something to consider. Um, regulatory compliance is often a factor because that dictates in some cases that. Uh, data, especially sensitive data and, and certain applications have to be run uh, on premises and cannot be in the public cloud. Um, getting more out of out of your data center. So what Kubernetes and containers really can bring you if, if, if you do it right, it's an opportunity to kind of modernize in some senses and just take your existing infrastructure and get more out of it. I think the, the, the efficiencies are, are, are definitely there if, if you go about it right. And then, you know, certain workloads may just require higher IOPS and much lower latency than what you can get from some public cloud infrastructure. And so, um, probably a, a handful of cases where performance is definitely a factor. But I would say that, you know, this, I, I personally have not come across um, this as the main reason for, uh, for somebody looking to build their own infrastructure for Kubernetes on-prem. So we'll transition a bit here. We'll we'll have a deeper look at Kubernetes. I think you know th this will be um, this will be valuable for those that you know have a, a cursory knowledge of what Kubernetes is all about. Um, but just you know setting some additional context for the the main part of the presentation here. Um, Kubernetes does so many things, but you know you could kind of boil it down to you know th these main points here. It it, it and I, and I like the way that it was put in this quote. And for those of you that are not familiar with uh, Kelsey Hightower, um, he's uh, he's become a very um, you know big personality in in the cloud native world. He's a developer advocate at Google, uh, really brilliant guy and a great speaker. And if you ever have a chance to attend KubeCon and um, hear some of his keynotes, it's highly worth it. And there's a ton of recorded material online as well but he, he describes kubernetes pretty simply as as the the linux of the cloud you know, the operating system of the cloud and um, essentially what it does so assigning containers to, uh, to 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 machines you know scheduling workloads where um where there are resources for them um, containers need to be spun up um, and restarted in case there's a failure so it, it does that it deals with upgrades uh, rollbacks and you know the system is constantly changing because it's so dynamic and it also creates cluster resources like service discovery uh, inter vm networking and ingress and egress and so forth so the, i mean there's a tremendous amount amount of functionality but essentially you're orchestrating containerized workloads and and in recent years kubernetes has really risen to become the de facto standard i think everything now gravitates toward uh, Kubernetes in, in, in the ecosystem. So, you know, here's a system that's designed for scalability, availability, security, and, and portability. A, a lot of, uh, a lot of illities here, but essentially it's, um, it's a great way to optimize the cost of your infrastructure, um, being able to, uh, whoops, apologies for that. Um, It's a great way to um, distribute workloads across uh, systems where resources are available. There are a lot of different components here. Um, you know, each each component um, can be configured for for high availability. Um, in many cases, you'll have um, you know two or more master nodes in an HA configuration. Um, you know, you could see here in the in the graphic on the bottom right here, um, you've got users that 
uh, will interact with, with Kubernetes via control plane, um, and there are components that are installed on, on each node in the cluster. So you probably heard the term uh, pod, uh, if you're getting familiar with Kubernetes. Kubernetes has this, um, you know, call it the, the unit of execution here. So pods are, are basically processes that are running on a Kubernetes cluster. And apologies, um, the slides see, seem to be uh, jumping forward here. Um, so uh, the controller will run pods according to uh, a pod spec. So this is something that the user creates. And you can see here on the right, uh, a very basic example of a pod spec. Uh, there's, there's metadata. Um, you know, the, the containers will, will have um, their own names and of course the, the resources that they require. And that's, um, that, that's an interesting point that I, I wanna highlight here. If you look at uh, what's in the green box on the right, um, you'll see a declaration for uh, resources. So this effectively carves out how much CPU you would like that pod to, uh, to have. And so um, here there's a limit and that's like the, the nice to have and then the request what you really need. Um, so it's great. There's a, there's a declarative model here for, uh, for, for running a pod and, and, um, and, and getting resources like CPU and memory. So that should make it pretty easy, uh, you would think. But what about persistent storage? What about networking, load balancing, security, monitoring, logging, application management availability? So there's a whole host of things here that don't necessarily follow that simple declarative model uh, for configuring. And so, you know, there, there are just a ton of technologies out there, um, many open source, uh, many commercial offerings too. In the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, there are probably 500 plus <clears throat> of these technologies across many different categories um, in, in the Kubernetes orbit here. Um, everything ranging from databases to uh, developer tools, to uh, proxies, gateways, and service mesh. Uh, security is, is such a huge area, obviously, because it, it continues to be a top concern. Uh, monitoring and observability, storage, networking. So, like, you you look at this and and just the myriad of options that you have in each category. I mean, can really be uh, can really be overwhelming when you're trying to figure out what it is that um, that your environment requires based on um, your end goals. So, uh, given all of that, you know, we've talked about. Kubernetes being incredibly deep and complex, um, especially if you're looking to build your own Kubernetes environment in your data center. Um, and so, you know, figuring all this out and and finding a way to effectively manage it. And I think that's probably the the, the greatest challenge for an IT operations team is, you know, how do you do this and deliver the resources that your developers are asking for when they need them? Um, in a lot of cases, developers just don't care about infrastructure, I guess, in, in, until they're not getting what they need, and then it becomes uh, a huge issue. So what we're going to talk about here um, are, are basically guidelines and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll describe seven areas that um, if you focus on, on those and you... You look at ways to uh, to simplify the management of those areas and and automate them in some ways. That'll give you a, a substantial leg up in um, in successfully managing your your Kubernetes infrastructure on prem. So the first challenge is uh, is really around upgrades, and so you you've got a, a couple of considerations here. It's not just about upgrading the version of Kubernetes. Uh, it's also upgrading the uh, the host OS, and you know as you can see here, I'm not going to read through every single step uh, that I've listed out here, but there's a, there's a, a process to follow, and 
you know, whether if you're doing this manually, you know, let's say you have a very small cluster. Um, again, scale will complicate a lot of things uh, with respect to uh, to Kubernetes. So here, you know, all the steps that you have to go through. Um, a couple of slides back, we looked at, you know, so the the, the kind of a, a representation of, of what is Kubernetes, and you saw all the different components there. All of those components have to be upgraded. So the the master node <clears throat> needs an upgrade. Um, its control plane, uh, the kubelet and kubectl have to be upgraded. And then there's there's a whole process for doing that. And then you have to upgrade Kubernetes on your worker nodes, and then etcd, which is the uh, Kubernetes key value store. So there's really quite a bit to do here. And and again, you know th that's just Kubernetes. If you're going to upgrade the host OS, um, there's a similar process. Uh, so you're kind of looking at a lot of work. Now, you know, we talked a bit about you know how fast Kubernetes is evolving, and if you have it in mind that you want to be up to date with every single release, you're looking at at least you know going through this at least four times per year if not more. And so, um, you know, the, the, the approach to this is, is pretty simple. Um, take all that undifferentiated heavy lifting and find a solution that can make that um, a push button process for you. Um, this is the kind of stuff that you definitely don't want to be uh, tied up with, especially, uh, you know, once a quarter and, and possibly more often. Um, what you want is is a, a dedicated Kubernetes management solution, and there are obviously several out there. Um, you know, OpenShift and Rancher are popular ones. Um, you've got VMware and Pivotal, and there's a whole host of uh, um, you know solutions that you can deploy that that will take care of this kind of stuff. Um, you know, Carbon is Nutanix's. Uh, Kubernetes management solution. Um, this is one area that we make possible with with a single click, and that's really what it should be. Um, this is not anything that would uh, that would add value. This is like a lot of uh, uh, a lot of maintenance. So um, one thing you do want to ensure, though, the solution that you pick should be one that can execute upgrades that are non-disruptive. So keep that in mind. All right, so the second challenge is around uh, persistent storage. And I remember reading a, a quote from um, one of the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation leaders in, in, in which he identified uh, there, there were four like critical challenges with Kubernetes. There was storage, uh, I think that was the number one, uh, storage security, networking, and, and monitoring. And these are like, you know, major, major challenges for uh, for for most folks, um, when when you bear in mind that uh, containers are ephemeral, you know you, you've probably heard the analogy uh, pets versus cattle. Um, you know a pet could be a, a server, you know physical or virtual that you kind of take care of and and you nurture and and you you spend a lot of time maintaining that. Containers really just are, are more like cattle. They they've got a a number. You know you spin them up. Um, they may just die at some point, um, you can spin it right back up. So, you know, th this makes for a very dynamic environment. And when, when you want to preserve data and you have a stateful application, you know, you need to figure out how to keep your storage connected to the pod that's hosting that application. So it's important um, more so today than ever before, because in the beginning when, uh, you know, if you go back a couple of years, like, Stateless applications were really, um, you know, the, the majority of of what we were seeing uh, being containerized, and therefore, you know, you didn't really have to worry about storage. And you know, once more stateful applications uh, started to be developed uh, for containers and microservices, then um, you know, this challenge became a, a lot uh, bigger and more prevalent. So the mechanism for uh, for exposing block and file storage to containers is the CSI. This is the the container storage interface. Um, this is basically a plugin. So before drivers had to be 
uh, storage drivers, I should say, had to be incorporated into the next version of Kubernetes. And at some point that became really unwieldy. So, th you know, this became a way to, you know, take your storage driver, plug it into Kubernetes, uh, whichever one you wanted to use. And, and, um, and, and that's sort of the mechanism right now. Um, there's some decisions that you do have to make up front, and obviously it depends on your environment, what kind of storage you you like to employ, and, and what the application needs. So um, how do you make it accessible to Kubernetes clusters, and then how is it going to be provisioned and, and used by the applications that are running on the cluster? So how to simplify here. Um, you know, again, a dedicated container storage solution is is really what's needed. Um, that's going to do most of the heavy lifting here. Uh, you probably want to look at one that offers support for the three major classes of, of storage. You know, again, it depends on the application. So if your application is really performance intensive, you'll probably want to uh, you you'll probably want to attach block storage. Uh, when multiple pods need access to the same storage, you need to file storage with uh, read, write, many capability. And then something that's easy to configure and will hold up with uh, a very large scale is object storage. So automation is your friend here. Um, you definitely want a solution also, uh, or, or any kind of means of automatically installing CSI drivers on every Kubernetes cluster. Uh, along with the the ability to create a default storage class. So third challenge, um, this gets into security, which is uh, which is always an interesting topic. And and as I mentioned, one of the you know the the major challenges with uh, Kubernetes and cloud native applications. Uh, again, like all the traditional security tools. Um, will fall short and this has everything to do with you know not only the ephemeral nature of containers but um, how they're networked and you know you, you can imagine all of the considerations that um, that security teams and and it operations are, are trying to tackle here but one one important area is the secret and so you know secret is uh, basically an object that's used to store sensitive data in Kubernetes. And it's, um, you know, I'd say that uh, by default, you know, it, it's something that can be accessed using uh, kubectl or, or via the, the Kubernetes API. Um, <clears throat> the output's encoded, so they're, they're not in clear text. Um, but you know, encoding doesn't really protect the secret. Uh, it can be easily decoded, so uh, not a great security posture right off the bat here. Um, you know, Kubernetes does provide some basic security capabilities around secrets. Um, you know, whether it's encryption uh, policies or maybe um, accessing by whitelist, but you, you have to enforce those. You definitely have to enforce those. That that's the key. Um, the other thing is like secrets when you're developing an application, let's say you've you've kind of set that up. Um, if there's any change in that, it's possible that a secret can break an application in, in production. So that's definitely something to look out for. So dedicated secrets management tool, that's kind of becoming a, a theme here that, you know, for each of these areas, there's some kind of um, you know, third-party dedicated technology that that you can deploy. Um, but again, the, you know, this is an ecosystem. Um, you know, Kubernetes on its own can't do everything, um, but there are a lot of uh, a lot of point solutions um, that you can incorporate successfully that that will take care of those things. So, um, a secrets management tool, uh, you definitely want to get one that works on on individual containers. So. As we mentioned, secrets can break applications in production. Um, you want something that can automatically push change secrets to the application containers that, that will rely on them. So um, having that capability is, is a huge win. All right, um, challenge number four of seven. 
service discovery. So networking, again, one of the top challenges in Kubernetes to solve. Um, networking, you can you can approach this uh, several different ways. I think there's uh, there's no um, you know there, there are probably several uh, networking approaches that are that are in widespread use. There's not necessarily one way to to do this. Um, you know, with networking, uh, Kubernetes will assign pods their own IP addresses, uh, as well as like a single DNS name for a set of pods. And, and effectively, it can load balance across those. Uh, but uh, because a pod can be scheduled on one cluster node and then uh, move to another, so any internal IPs that the pod is assigned are going to change over time, or they, they can change over time. And making pods reachable to external networks without relying on any internal IPs, that, that's the big challenge, and that's gonna require another layer of abstraction. So in this case, <clears throat> you'll definitely want to employ a load balancer. And so load balancers are, are pretty invaluable in that they, they provide each pod a unique IP address that's accessible outside of the cluster. Um, that functionality is not really part of Kubernetes. It's it, it kind of either relies on the infra infrastructure provider or on an open source tool. Uh, one example is, is Metal LB. Um, here, you know, much like uh, storage, there is a, a standard um, a, a plugin. There's a, a container network interface available, and and that can also enable routing to individual pods. Um, now, for business critical applications that require like high robustness, Kubernetes ingress is recommended. So that's um, that effectively that allows for name-based virtual hosting and SSL termination, in addition to load balancing. And so this is this is one of the more feature-rich um, capabilities. It's still pretty complicated and uh, will rely on a third-party controller. Um, some of the the more popular ones are, are Nginx and Traffic or Istio. So how do you manage applications, or at least you know how do you make that um, much easier? Um, when you look at uh, your your typical containerized application, it's likely to to include several services that span a couple dozen containers. <clears throat> it's got persistent volumes, uh, secrets, which we talked about, and stateful sets. So um, you can definitely uh, create a namespace for each application. You know, it's a, it's a great way to kind of, uh, you know, simplify management for for um, for the cluster. But this is an approach that doesn't really scale. And again, it it this totally depends on on the size and and breadth of your containerized applications. But uh, not not recommended at scale, um, which you know, kind of conceptually that that applies to uh, you know quite a bit of, of what you would do in Kubernetes. You know, things that are easy at, at small scale become huge problems uh, when when you look at uh, much larger scale. You need to be able to deploy and modify and track changes and upgrade your applications. That's that's really where you want to focus your attention on. So how do you simplify all this? So um, a package manager is a good start, like Helm. Um, however, uh, you know, despite it being one of the more popular tools, it also introduces a new set of challenges around uh, tracking application configuration and source control management uh, while you're locking down access to prevent any untracked changes. Now, Kubernetes operators are created to solve those challenges uh, and they're definitely recommended for production workloads. Uh, building an operator, that's that's an undertaking in and of itself, but it's totally worth it. Uh, it, it will take a long time to build, but what you're getting out of that is uh, the ability, you know, you, you're, you're getting to, you're, you're building something that will allow for IT team members that aren't experts in a particular application to, to better manage it. So rather than having the applications developers uh, do all the work uh, using operators, um, 
developers can can write the code once uh, and and they can describe how an application should be upgraded and then uh, the Kubernetes admin can easily initiate the upgrade when it's needed. So definitely a lot of work, but it, it will pay off. So monitoring and logging, you know, being able to being able to, being able to figure out how to make sense of all of the data that a Kubernetes environment will generate. And again, because it's so highly dynamic, there's probably an order of magnitude more activity data that you could potentially collect in, in uh, a given period of time than uh, with a legacy application and, and uh, traditional infrastructure stack. You know, the, the key challenge here is just figuring out a way to make sense of all of the monitoring and logging data that, that you've got, and um, can you effectively pinpoint and remediate issues? So, you know, there, there's some great technologies out there uh, that are open source, but it, it doesn't necessarily solve the problem. What you need is, is kind of a, a, a broader set of uh, technologies in, in a stack. Um, single tool is just not enough uh, to do it. So there are two kinds of stacks that uh, that I've listed out here. Um, you know, when you deploy these, that'll give you the ability to store, search, analyze, and and then visualize all of the environment data. So there's an ELK stack, which is Elasticsearch Logstash and Kibana and an EFK stack, um, you know, same components except um, Fluent-D instead of Logstash. You know, Prometheus is also widely used. Um, this, is, this is also featured in, uh, in Nutanix Carbon, which as I mentioned is our, our Kubernetes management solution. So again, um, it is a, a bit tricky to, to configure and size and, um, you know, make sure you're you're using the the logging stack uh, properly. That that will take some time to kind of get around. But um, you know, bear in mind also that uh, cluster level logging and application logging are are separate processes in most cases. So finally, uh, you know, the seventh challenge that we've outlined here is around scaling. So you have a variety of options. Uh, for automatic scaling in Kubernetes. You know, do you scale the application, do you scale the pod, or do you scale the whole cluster? So what, what ultimately is the right approach? And that's really what it comes down to. Um, I guess a lot, of, a lot of flexibility and a lot of choice, uh, you know, sometimes can, uh, you know, can be challenging on its own. So there, there, there are two choices here, uh, you know, two approaches that we'll talk about. So if you want to automatically scale the application, um, that's built that, that capability is built directly into Kubernetes, and it's it's handled via horizontal pod auto scaling. Um, now I should point out that it's it's first required that you have to ensure there's enough cluster capacity to support the maximum scaling values, and then um, you can take the approach of automatically scaling worker nodes. So again, you either, uh, you know, depend on your, your cloud provider if, um, if you're working with a uh, Kubernetes uh, environment that's uh, um, based in the cloud or um, your, your ops team on-prem. So here, you definitely, you, you don't just want to scale without any limit. You want to be mindful of the actual resources that, that you do have. So we've talked about challenges and, and some, uh, some guidelines for, for tackling those and, and kind of making your, your whole uh, Kubernetes lifecycle management experience a lot easier and uh, um, you know, more doable. One thing to point out though, and, and again, there are lots of uh, variations of, of Kubernetes, different versions. When you look at solutions for automation and uh, management of Kubernetes, keep in mind that, you know, as you look at these different <clears throat> offerings, uh, not all of them are created equal. And so what I mean by that is that, 
um, you know, if you have a distribution of Kubernetes that is CNCF certified, uh, you know that it conforms, um, and you know that's where you definitely want to start. Um, you also want to be wary of any elements that solution brings that are uh, proprietary. You know, sometimes it's it's great to have additional functionality, but by the same token, if uh, you know if you value flexibility and you know portability of some workloads, you, you just want to be mindful that. Um, those proprietary extensions may lock you in and, and create some friction points in moving an application from your environment to, to another. Uh, intelligent automation, that, you know, th that's a central theme to everything that we talked about. If you can find uh, solutions that give you push button automation of a lot of the, um, you know, the, the, the grunt work, I guess, um, then that's a huge win. Uh, and you definitely want to think in terms of, you know, not just Kubernetes itself, but all of the areas around it that we've talked about, storage, uh, networking, security, and monitoring. As I mentioned, those are the big challenges. You, you definitely want a, a more complete solution or at least one where it's easier to integrate not only <clears throat> you know those elements but with with the uh, the entire stack as well. And finally, um, you know this is a, a short plug for um, you know for the Linux Foundation and CNCF. Um, for those of you that haven't really engaged with them before, I mean they have an, a wealth of resources. I personally think this is a, a tremendous community that's been built around Kubernetes. And <clears throat> you know, with that, there's a tremendous amount of knowledge and expertise that can be shared. Um, <clears throat> one training program that's now available if you uh, really want to beef up your chops and become a certified Kubernetes admin, um, you can develop those competencies uh, through their, their certification program. So I talked a bit about um, what Nutanix has. Um, it's a relatively new offering, one that we introduced just a little over a year ago. Um, Carbon is our enterprise Kubernetes management solution. And so, you know, what we do is, again, create, um, you know, push button workflows around a lot of uh, what, I, what I've talked about. Uh, so simplicity is really, you know, that's been a, a focus of Nutanix uh, as a, you know, it, it came up as a company and 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 really um, you know pioneered hyperconverged infrastructure, and so that's that's a core tenet of of what we do. And so uh, you know we we've endeavored to bring that to Kubernetes management um, as a complete solution. Carbon is is part of a cloud native stack that we offer that incorporates. Um, not only uh, uh, storage, but monitoring, logging, and alerting, and, and workload automation. And <clears throat> we've we've built uh, we've we've built a solution that does not lock you in. Um, you know, we we expose our our full APIs, and um, there are no proprietary elements really that would prevent you from uh, moving workloads off of a carbon managed uh, Kubernetes environment to another. So that wraps up um, the presentation portion of the program. Um, again, thank you so much. I mean, it's it's been uh, great to be able to present here. And again, um, I, I really appreciate uh, taking the time to uh, to join the program. Hopefully, you've got some valuable ideas and, and takeaways from the material that I presented. Um, we'll have a chance to to dive into some Q and A here. All right. Um, Cool, cool. Well, we've gotten a whole lot of questions in so far, um, but there is time. If you have a question for Sean, please go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel. And uh, with that, let's go ahead and dive into the first question. Uh, is running Kubernetes better on VMs or on bare metal infrastructure? Aha, uh -huh. um, interesting question. It's um, it, it it really depends. I I, I do think that. So there, there are several advantages, you know, and it, it, it does seem that, you know, even with um, the 
public cloud providers that even though you don't have tremendous visibility into that infrastructure, but uh, uh, I would say the vast majority of it is uh, is virtualized. Um, and virtualization is is something, you know, given it's like 20 year track record, let's say as a, you know, commercially viable technology, you know, that's what everybody's got experience with and knows how to manage. So, the, you know, that's definitely a plus. You know, th those of you that are security minded, uh, and I, you know, I, I would argue that we all should be, uh, th there are some security advantages to running uh, containers on top of VMs, um, you know, mainly just because the the VM is is isolated. So, you know, that's that's an important security characteristic that I don't think should be, um, I, I don't think should be overlooked. So, it better in in some senses, um, you know, bare metal may give you a higher container density in some cases. You know, and that's really just a, a utilization um, consideration. But um, it seems to be that most, you know, most folks that are running Kubernetes are doing so on on top of virtualized infrastructure. All right. Hopefully that that answers the question. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Um, wow. So many good questions. Here's one, here's one for you. Um, you say legacy infrastructure isn't built for Kubernetes. Are you saying the existing legacy applications won't ever move to cloud and must be recreated? Um, no, I, I'm, I'm definitely not saying that. And um, just you know, going back to um, my response to the previous question, um, which I think applies here, is that um, you know VMs are are not going to be you know, categorically replaced with containers anytime soon. I think, you know, there are a lot of applications that um, can still run in their um, legacy form, you know, alongside containerized applications on, on the same infrastructure. That's that's definitely possible, uh, and especially if if you're if you're running Kubernetes on on top of uh, virtualized infrastructure. Um, there are probably some applications, and you know, I, I wish I had a really good list of specific examples. But so, you know, a database, for example, you know, we see a lot of customers kind of running databases, um, you know, traditional database platforms versus uh, containerized databases. And there are some really great um, <clears throat> databases as service solutions out there for Kubernetes. Um, but again, you know, it comes down to, uh, to, to preference, you know, some applications are easily containerized. You, you may yeah. have, you know, some proprietary software that you've built and, um, it may be as simple as creating a container image, packaging it all up and, and just running that as a container. So. It, it really depends. I, I, I think, you know, to be cloud native, you don't necessarily have to be uh, as an application containerized, but that, that is one of the, you know, the, the key characteristics. You can definitely run other applications, uh, you know, in a, in a hybrid cloud or a, a you know, multi-cloud way um, mm -hmm. without containers. Okay. All right, great. Uh, let's see. Next question: uh, Can you automate security in Kubernetes? Um, wow. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah. The the answer is in part uh, yes. There 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 are some security um, processes that that you can and definitely should automate. And um, it, it's it's a really deep topic because when you, when you look at Kubernetes, and now I, you know, I, I would, I would point out that, um, you know, the industry has has really shifted to um, securing Kubernetes and and the the components of the Kubernetes platform, uh, whereas in the early days it, it it really seemed to be focused mostly on the container. Um, there were uh, you know build phase security processes. Um, and then deploy 
you know, the deploy phase um, security, you know, it, you know, you, you saw different approaches to number one, like harden the container, um, you know, running CIS benchmarks and, um, and, and doing a lot of vulnerability assessment. You know, there, there are those processes that can be automated and, and you know, we, we've, we've seen many of them applied uh, to the DevOps pipeline as well. So as the, as containerized applications are being built, um, there are security checks that uh, that can be performed automatically in uh, in a production container or Kubernetes environment. Um, there, yeah, I would say you know you can automate some some security, but there, you know, when you when you look at the container or the Kubernetes cluster, you know, across that whole life cycle, there, you know, there, there are <clears throat> many things that you do have to look at. Um, Everything from hardening to, uh, you know, what does a, a threat in a container environment even look like and, and how would that play out? So I don't know if the automation is is there or at least those capabilities are uh, are really mature at this point. But um, but certainly a lot of what you can do to, uh, you know, to make a container image more robust or to to harden your, your uh, Kubernetes cluster and its components, you can definitely do that. Okay, all right, great. So we're about uh, four, no, nine minutes to the top of the hour. Uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions here. Um, let's see, next question. Can you manage all Kubernetes clusters with one tool? Is that an impossible task? Is it doable? Um, ideally, yeah, it, it would be <clears throat> great to do that. Um, you know, uh, it's kind of multi-cloud management. Um, you know, there, there are some tools that are that are getting there um, that will give you visibility and and control, kind of like a single control plane for uh, deployments in the public cloud or on-prem. Um, we work with a, a couple of those, and we we've also got our own um, approach that we're we're building out. Um, but yeah, that, that is definitely the goal. As I mentioned before, you know, I, I it's it's extremely rare that you know when when I talk to folks out there in the industry that they're they're either all in on the public cloud or doing things exclusively on prem. I think having the combination of uh, you know running applications in AWS or, or Google Cloud or Azure plus you know, doing some stuff in your own data center, that, that seems to be the norm. So uh, the next logical step is figuring out, you know, how do I coordinate and, you know, how, how do I burst to the cloud or how do I manage all of my uh, clusters with a single pane of glass? And so, uh, yeah, that, it definitely is possible that those solutions are, 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 are maturing. All right. Let's see. Okay, um, next question. How does Carbon differentiate itself from Rancher and OpenShift? Uh, good question. Uh, you know, Rancher and and OpenShift. Um, you know, they've they've been around for uh, for longer. So when you know they they offer a, a pretty considerable breadth of functionality. Um, it, in essence, you know, it it really just comes down to um, you know complexity. I think if you if you want to contrast, you know, carbon versus those um, you know more developed solutions, uh, there's, there there is a lot of heavy lifting that goes into deploying uh, OpenShift, for example. Um, it it does have a lot of um, you know a tremendous amount of features, um, you know, many of which that you know are great for developers and you know depending on on what you're doing with your your on-prem uh, Kubernetes environment. Um, there are some proprietary elements there, as I mentioned. You know, for those of you that you know want flexibility without being locked in, you know, I would say, uh, you know, Car Carbon does a handful of things uh, to simplify Kubernetes management, and it does them extremely well. Um, it's also fully integrated into Nutanix AHV, which is our our, our hypervisor layer. So you know, if you happen to be a Nutanix customer, you can simply turn Carbon on, and it's it's part of our our broader offering. But I would say that the the main differences are really just around functionality. Um, 
and the the complexity of those solutions you know it, it does make sense that as you you're able to do more and more um you know again it it will take you longer to configure and deploy that solution and tune it to uh to how your users your, your users are going to use it um <clears throat> So that, you know that that essentially is is the main difference. Okay. All right. All right. Great. Well, we're about five minutes to the top of the hour, so unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for a question and answer period. Uh, we had a ton of questions, and I know uh, we didn't get to a lot of them. But please know that the folks at Nutanix will be getting a copy of all of the questions. So I'm sure somebody from their organization. Uh, we'll be more than happy to follow up with you offline to make sure that your questions are answered. I uh, also want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the event, or if you just want to listen to it again, you'll have the opportunity to do so. Today's uh, event, uh, as I said, has been recorded in, uh, in about an hour or so. We will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. Uh, the webinar is also going to be living on the Container Journal website, so you can always go look for it there. Uh, just go to www.containerjournal.com slash webinars and look in the on-demand section and it should be right there waiting for you. Okay, also at the top of the hour, I know I uh, talked about a drawing for two $50 Amazon gift cards. So without further ado, let's go ahead and do that now. Today's winners are uh, Daryl J. Congratulations, Daryl. Daryl. <laughs> and our, our second winner is Philip P. Congratulations, Philip. We'll be following up with both of you offline to uh, make sure that uh, you get your email. Uh, you get your gift card via email, so uh, please check your email uh, for a message from us. Uh, Sean, thank you for giving such a great presentation today. Um, judging from the number of questions we got in, uh, I know the audience got a lot out of it. It was a great presentation all the way around, so thanks. All right, thank you so much. All right, great. also want to thank the audience for joining me today. Uh, this is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody. Stay safe.